Well, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but Extra History has a new series that they're currently releasing, and it's on one of my all-time favorite historical figures, somebody who doesn't get talked about nearly enough in terms of the uh, impact that she had and her connection to so many of the people that we talk about in medieval history. It's Eleanor of Aquitaine. So we're going to go ahead and dive into episode one of Extra History's Eleanor of Aquitaine. I don't know what their release schedule is for the rest of this, but as they release new episodes, we will do the reactions to them. Uh, so we'll have to come back uh, when they do more. But as always, the link is in the description to the original content. Check it out and Go Rangers! Champions League, baby! Here we go. April, 1137, Paris. King Louis the Fat is having a very up-and-down sort of day. First of all, he's mortally ill, which of course isn't great, but then a party arrives bringing awful news. William X, Duke of Aquitaine, has died of an unexpected illness. They have his will, stating that his lands will go to his young daughter, and that she is to be under King Louis's care until he can find her a husband. Louis conveys his grief to the messengers, until they leave when he bubbles over with joy because William's Duchy of Aquitaine is the largest, richest province in all of France. And whoever marries this girl, what's her name? Uh, oh, Eleanor or whatever. Yeah, they're going to get the whole shebang. And it just so happens that Louis has the perfect husband for this land deed and address. Within hours, he's made arrangements to marry Eleanor to his own heir, Louis VII. Yeah, so this is a big, big deal. Aquitaine is huge. It is powerful it is wealthy it's a big chunk of france and it's now owned by a woman who is not married and so she's going to take that into whatever relationship she goes into and it's basically like if you follow my gaming channel at all crusader kings 3 you make these marriages hoping that hoping that heirs are going to inherit and so by making this marriage potentially you have the heir uh, to the throne, also inheriting Aquitaine, which would be a huge deal for the French monarchy. Winning a wife for his son and Aquitaine for the crown, though the son would manage to lose them both. Thanks so much to Brilliant for helping us to tell today's historical tale. On July 25th, 1137, not even four months after losing her father, the teenage Eleanor stood next to Louis VII at Bordeaux Cathedral, exchanging wedding vows with the heir to the French throne. Who was this new husband? She must have wondered. Well, in short, he was a 17-year-old boy who was smitten with her, but also deeply mismatched personality-wise. And it's important to note, too, that I understand why they do it. They're calling him Louis VII. He's not king. Uh, it's just calling him that because that's how he is remembered in history. Louis grew up thinking his older brother Philip would become king, but that changed after Philip tragically hilariously brutally died when a horse tripped over a pig. Now I know what you're thinking. How absolutely awful, Matt. You uh, don't happen to have a picture of this melancholy event, do you? Oh, yeah we do. Anyway, before the porcine assassin leapt from a dung heap and murked Philip, yeah it also came out of a dung heap, Louis was bound for the church and educated in a monastery. Make Can we just stop for a second and think about how history changes sometimes on seemingly random and stupid things like this uh like a horse tripping over a pig and killing the heir to the throne there are so many times in history where it's just little things it's a matter of inches we've talked about this before a uh, driver taking a wrong turn uh that leads to the assassination of Fr uh, franz ferdinand which leads to world war one um just little choices sometimes that can completely change the trajectory of history. Who knows what happens if his older brother lives and she marries him instead. Maybe the marriage works out. Maybe she never marries the king of England. Maybe then Aquitaine doesn't get passed on uh, to her children through the king of England instead of the king of France. Completely different world. Making him a very, very religious young man who did not have much experience with women outside of his family. But who was Eleanor by contrast? Well, it's hard to know, because we know little about her early life, not even when she was born. We think she was married at age 13, but she could have been a year younger or older. We do know that she received a good education, that she spoke Latin, and that she was very much a person shaped by her home and family. Aquitaine was in the south of France, a rich and beautiful place with its own dialect, where relationships tended to be warmer and more affectionate than in the north. She also came from a family known for its passions. For instance, her grandfather William IX was a poet who was famous for having painted his mistress's face on his shield and moving her into his castle. 
So essentially, they were a bit of an odd couple, and not the kind that works. But they'd have to make it work, because less than a week after their wedding, Louis VI died, making this mismatched teenage Dang. couple the king and queen of odds? France, and Eleanor, arguably the most powerful woman in Europe. As queen consort, Eleanor moved to Paris and quickly found it inhospitable. Though Louis refurbished his palaces to please his southern bride, the intelligent and vivacious Eleanor, who had a fondness for fashion and often spoke her mind, clashed with both her mother-in-law and the abbots who clustered around Louis as his advisors. Also, she was in a precarious spot, because Eleanor had one job, to have a son, and she wasn't having any kids at all. Yeah, there were issues. Eleanor appears to have had at least one miscarriage, and she was still quite young when they were married. I was gonna say, she was like 13 when they got married, so it seems to me like there should have been a little bit of patience on the whole marriage front. I think they end up having two daughters and no sons. Um, and they're married for like better than a decade, if I remember right, so she's still fairly young when they get divorced. Also, Louis himself might not have had his head in the game. See, the medieval church had a lot of rules about when couples shouldn't be baby-making. For example, saints' days and religious festivals were out, as well as times in a woman's menstrual cycle, which narrowed the window considerably. Now, most practical royal couples ignored this, but the hyper-religious Louis may have not. Though in fairness, there were quickly other things preoccupying his mind. You know, like fighting with the Pope. That began in 1141, when the Pope appointed an archbishop in one of Louis' cities that the king had previously vetoed. The result was a standoff, where Louis denied the archbishop entry, and in retaliation, the Pope banned Louis from certain church rites. Then, shortly there- At least it didn't go as far as excommunication, but uh, yeah, this is the kind of standoff that was a regular thing. It's that, that power struggle between the secular authorities and the religious authorities, and who has the right to make these decisions. The same thing's going to go on not too much down the road, when you're going to have similar issues happening with the King of England dealing with the church having authority over its own so that secular authorities couldn't do things like try a priest for murder or for other crimes. The church would have its own trial and the secular authorities wanted that and all of that is going to come to a head when you get into the 16th century and you're dealing with Henry VIII in England wanting to break away completely from the authority of the church and establish himself as both secular authority and also religious authority. Uh, so this was a struggle that went on for hundreds and hundreds of years. Thereafter, Eleanor started urging Louis to allow her younger sister to marry one of France's most important nobles. The catch being that this prospective groom was already married and Eleanor's sister already promised to the Duke of Champagne, the Duke who was sheltering that archbishop. Louis saw this request as a win-win-win. Help a friend, please his wife, and mess over a rival. Except it led to the Pope excommunicating the new couple and Louis going to war with Champagne. And excommunication on the surface today might not seem like a big deal, but it was basically the Pope saying, you're going to hell. And uh, not only did it cut you off from the church, but it also meant a lot of times that other countries basically had free reign. They had a casus belli to go to war with you because you were an excommunicated uh, ruler who didn't deserve to be on the throne anymore. So I don't know if that happened in this case, but excommunication was pretty much one of the worst things that could happen to you. And a lot of people would really be upset by that. Other rulers just didn't care. And when Louis ravaged one of the Duke's cities, he accidentally burned down a church where 1,200 innocents were sheltering, which led to a papal condemnation. Eleanor decided to intervene, taking one of Louis's abbot advisors to task for not pleading the king's case with the new pope. And when he blew up at her in return, she apologized, saying that she was so irritable because she didn't have children. Which was probably true enough, but also could have been a sneaky way to go nuclear, make her point, and then walk away with the abbot's sympathy. The abbot eventually did intervene, and by the next year, the papal relationship had been repaired and she had a daughter. But Louis's conscience had never recovered from the church burning. And when the Crusader Kingdom of Edessa fell, and the Pope called for a second crusade to win it back, the King volunteered to wash away his sins. Yeah, and we've talked about this before too. The Crusade's a great opportunity for you to get in right with the church again, especially a guy who's been previously excommunicated, uh, to prove yourself worthy once again. Uh, but I want to look a little further into this church burning situation because uh, it seems like something that big shouldn't just be glossed over. So this town is known as Vitry, uh, Vitry-en-Pertois today, but it was 
also known as Vitry Le Brule, which is Vitry the Burnt. Um, and it's got quite a history. Um, when Louis the Seventh sacked the town in 1142, he's said to have spared the Jews who therefore constituted the majority of the population for a while. Um, I was reading a little bit more about it and said there were over a thousand. They had taken refuge in the church. The church was burned. That Louis didn't necessarily have anything to do with it, but he was there when it happened. Um, and it was burned again sometime later in the 1500s. Um, but it looks like in 1321, having been a uh, accused of poisoning the wells together with the lepers, 77 Jews were massacred there. Uh, at a different time. So uh, that comes from an encyclopedia on religion. It's actually really, really tough to find anything about this uh, situation and what happened. Uh, I've, been, I've been looking for like the last 10 minutes and haven't really been able to find anything. Um, it just says it reached its climax in 1143 when royal troops set fire to the town and over a thousand refugees, mainly women and children, perished when the church was burned to the ground. So It was the first time a king had gone on crusade and Eleanor decided she'd come too at the head of her duchy's troops. It was on crusade when things really started to fall apart. Louis argued with the Holy Roman Emperor about which route to take, and the Byzantine Emperor, while complimentary of Eleanor, was unfriendly. Louis also insisted on acting like a pilgrim on the journey, meaning not being near women. A plus move for a troubled marriage. Then disaster struck. Eleanor's contingent was leading the column, and when they were supposed to stop at the top of a mountain and camp, they decided to carry on to a better spot. Louis with the rear guard, and supposedly weighed down by Eleanor's baggage, lagged behind, and the line stretched. When Turkish... I love that they say supposedly there, because so many times in history, uh, we take a source or two that say something, and it's scandalous, or it's it's fun to, to believe that it was true, uh, and, we, and we teach it as though it is true, when really it just could be speculation. It might not be backed up by other sources. And as always, you got to con consider the sources. Who's writing this? Do they have an agenda? Do they have a bias for or against? That's why, for example, um, when it comes to stuff like the um, Wars of the Roses, uh, so often you have to take some of that stuff with a grain of salt because a lot of our history that we have on people like Richard III is written by uh, folks in the Tudor era who definitely have plenty of reason to want to make Henry Tudor look like the good guy and Richard III look like the bad guy. And so uh, it doesn't mean Richard III wasn't a bad guy. It just means we have to consider the source. So in this case, uh, after their marriage falls apart and Eleanor marries you know, the King of England of all people, uh, or the future King of England, uh, there are plenty of reasons for people in France to have said bad things about Eleanor of Aquitaine. British archers started firing from the rocky slopes. It was essentially a massacre, blamed on Eleanor's contingent. So the couple was already on bad terms when they entered Antioch, a city ruled by Eleanor's dashing uncle, Raymond the Handsome. There, the uncle and niece renewed their friendship with the familial warmth common in Aquitaine speaking in their own dialect that Louis couldn't understand. Louis got jealous, and rumors spread that Eleanor was having an incestuous affair with Raymond. And this wedge quickly went from personal to political. When Raymond... Which is kind of funny, the whole incestuous affair thing, because I believe in the end, the justification given for their annulment of their marriage was their close familial relationship wanted Louis to attack Aleppo, and Eleanor joined his lobbying effort. In a public break with his wife, Louis opted to go on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem instead, dragging her along as almost a prisoner. It was then she first mentioned the idea of an annulment on the grounds of consanguinity that they were too closely related. The crusade itself was an expensive disaster. With crusader forces broken and the couple barely speaking, they got on separate ships to head home. Attacked by pirates and separated in a storm, Eleanor briefly thought Louis was dead, but he wasn't. On a subsequent visit to the Pope, she again suggested annulment, but instead, the Pope offered marriage counseling, which, just to be clear, consisted of showing them a great bed he'd made himself, hung with nice tapestries all around. Ooh, look how bouncy! Why don't you two just spend the night in it? Eh? 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 They did, and had another daughter. Which was a relief for Eleanor, because at this point, she was looking for a way out. And her strongest argument was that in no 15 sense. years of marriage, she'd only had girls. Yep. If she'd had a boy, she'd be trapped. And Basically, the argument that Henry VIII is going to use a couple of centuries later when he's trying to get out from under his marriage to, um, to Catherine of Aragon is, look, 
I've had all these years of marriage with her, 20 some years. We've had multiple children that have either been stillborn or we have this one daughter, Mary. Uh, it's going to be his argument too. So it's interesting that it worked then uh, for Eleanor, but it doesn't work for Henry later. And because their marriage agreement said that Aquitaine was hers until the two had a male heir, now she could walk away Take it with, with her, her duchy. Needing a son, worrying for his dynasty, and now barred from Eleanor's bed, even the Pope's sexy time bed, Louis consented, and Eleanor got her divorce. Though she had to agree to never see her daughters again, as they were Louis's property. Now 28, the former Queen of France was beautiful, young, still had her enormous duchy, and was once again single, even if only for a little bit. Within eight weeks, she'd be married again to Henry II, a brash, passionate young man, 10 years her junior, who was also the future king of England. So join us next week for more wearing gowns and collecting crowns as Eleanor takes the English throne. So again, Henry II, he's not Henry II yet. He is, at the moment, he is the Duke of Normandy, I think. Um, but he's heir to the throne, assuming that things go his way, uh, which they do, I think, within a couple of years of their marriage, he comes to the throne. And uh, fascinating, fascinating story. Uh, this is a woman who's going to have several, uh, I think at least four or five of her children are going to be kings and queens. Um, so, so much of... European history is going to go through the story of Eleanor of Aquitaine. Uh, so I'm excited to continue that conversation to learn more than we currently know. Um, I'm not entirely sure why there's still two minutes to go in this video, so we'll see if there's anything else we need to watch. All right, so we're going to wrap it up right there. Um, in the meantime, while we wait for more episodes of Eleanor of Aquitaine, I'll give you some other episodes uh, of some things you can watch. Throw them up there on the screen. Check those out if you would. Please consider subscribing if you're new to the channel. We'll see you again soon. Thanks for watching.